The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the law offices of Jacob and Ronnie. Accident or injury, call Jacob and Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844-24-JACOB. That's 844-24-JACOB. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason, along with Sue Kalinske. Sue, morning times. You know, it's my favorite time of day to do a podcast. I'm always at my absolute best. How are you feeling? I'm feeling okay because we're a little bit later than usual for a morning show. Yes. People wonder how Mace sleeps so much. Because I go to bed at like, I'm usually asleep by 10. And I usually don't get up until... 8.30 or 9. So I'm like in the 11 hour range. And I think that for me, I think sleep is so underrated. It is so good. It is so delicious, for lack of a better word, to sleep in. What's your average uh, night of sleep like, Sue? How how long do you sleep? I don't sleep as long as I used to. I used to be a really good sleeper. Um, But as I get older, I get up earlier and earlier. Like sometimes I'm up at seven something or 8.30, 8.30 the latest. So why is it that when people, now you're a little older than me. You're not a lot older than me. Mm, Yeah. 10 years, maybe? I don't know. 10 years, 10 years. So why is it that when people get older, they sleep less? Like there must be a scientific explanation for this. Like my grandpa used to get up at 4 a.m. I'm like, you didn't sleep at all. He'd be in his chair at 4 a.m. watching the news or whatever it was at 4 a.m. And I'm like, how how do you even get by with that little amount of sleep? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that we don't have that many more years left. <laughs> and, bi- and biologically, they just want you to get in everything you can possibly get in. <laughs> you know what? That may be it. That may be it. Although I don't think my grandpa at 4 a.m. got much done. Just a, just a, a theory of mine. So uh, you mentioned uh, off the air my my sweater, my my brand new sweater. What do you think of my? If you're uh, if you're watching, you see it. If you're listening, you don't know, you don't see it. But what do you think? I, I like it. I commented. I, I it's it's cool. It looks American Indian kind of a uh, homage to Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh yeah. So you know where it's from? My designer, Amazon. This is an Amazon, Amazon original, um, and I think it's the only one. It's a unique piece, just like Cabbage Patch Dolls. By the way, Andrew Jenks is coming up. He directed Billion Dollar Babies, the true story of the Cabbage Patch Kids. But just like uh, Cabbage Patch Kids, no two sweaters are the same when they come from Amazon. Some of them are regulars. <laughs> Some of them are. Some of them are. So I wanted to tell you about this. Uh, I, actually, a couple of things. Let, let's do a couple of things. First of all, if you're listening, uh, please, on Apple, Spotify, leave us a five-star review uh, and leave us a, a rating why you like the show. Uh, also on YouTube, uh, subscribe to the channel and leave us a uh, comment. And if you're on Twitter or X or whatever the hell you like to call it, uh, we've got a Culture Pop podcast community that you can join. Uh, we talk movies, pop culture, all that kind of stuff. Um, and all you do is go to Twitter slash X, search the communities tab and find Culture Pop podcast. And you're with us and talking about pop culture every single day. I posted in there, Sue, because I saw a movie this weekend that was freaky. It is a twisted movie. It's called Salt Burn. And it is directed by Emerald Fennel, who directed Promising Young Woman, uh, which was, I think, two years ago with Carrie Mulligan. Now, in this one, first of all, let me just say, Jacob Elordi, who I talked about a couple of weeks ago on the show, uh, mm-hmm. because he plays Elvis in Priscilla, he's one of the stars here. He is going to be a gigantic movie star. He is so good. And... uh and very kind of classically good looking. And then Barry, and I think his name is Kyogen. Is it? Oh, it's Kyogen? Oh, Kogan? Kogan? Okay. Kogan? I'll spell it for those of you that are, it's K, 
K E O G A N, Kyogen, I think. I and then Rosman Pike and Richard E. Grant. So, Sue, there are scenes in here that will make you just like wide eyed. I can't believe that's happening. Just crazy. And the basic story is that Barry Kyogen plays this kind of regular kid um, at Oxford who gloms on to. Uh, I Jacob. don't want to know anything about oh, it. Oh, okay. All right. I won't tell yeah, you. Don't, don't, don't talk about it. Okay. Because I, I actually got the screener and I oh, never you did? heard of it. Yeah. Oh, so well, then, I'm, I'm, then after you watch it, we'll, we'll, we'll do a full okay. talk through. But it's, it's twisted as hell. And I think for sure, Oscar nomination for screenplay for Emerald Fennel. It's not best picture. Um, and I probably Barry Yogan and Jacob Lordy aren't necessarily. Um, acting nominees for the Oscars, but this is a really, really good twisted movie that you've never seen before, never seen anything like it. Uh, mm. So it's called Saltburn. It is out in limited release right now. Go check it out. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about, and then we'll get to your thing. Uh, the Eras movie, which is the Taylor Swift movie uh, of her concert, which I saw at SoFi Stadium. You saw it twice. Saw, no, I saw the movie twice. Oh, you saw saw the movie concert once. Okay. So the Oscars have a decision to make. Should they allow the Taylor Swift eras movie into the documentary category at the Academy Awards? Well, is is it's a documentary, right? It, It is the filming of a concert. There's, okay. it's not like there's any narrative stuff, but for me, this would be like a boon for the Oscars to get all of the Swifties watching the show, uh, with her nominated for best. I just think it's technically not a, a documentary in the traditional sense. It really is a filmed concert, but I think the Oscars would be smart to let it in. I, uh, I guess, I mean, I, I think of the last waltz and I haven't seen the last waltz in a long time. And, you know, historically it, was a lot more special because it was the last concert of the 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 band. Yes, and it was Martin Scorsese. Yeah, of so course. and I'm sure they. I, I I forget a lot of the interviews and 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 things like that. So this heiress film is it um is it like backstage stuff? No, I mean, it is it's just only the concert? the concert. Only the concert. Well, I don't no. know. I don't think it really warrants to be in the category. Don't then, you want a lot well, of Swifties watching the Oscars? The Oscars I, ratings I, I, are so shitty. Yeah, Why not? I, I guess I haven't really thought of it in that respect, but I'm just thinking that it it would it would push out an opportunity for someone who actually made a documentary. True, true. And 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 for me, you know, the integrity of being uh, nominated and having a, a, a chance of winning. Over the fact that, you know, you just want more people watching. I don't know. That's a tough call for me. Okay. Well, think of it this way. Like, I think we reward niche films at the Oscars. M- movie, I, I just mentioned Saltburn. The vast majority of people n- will never see Saltburn. Uh, the vast majority of people will probably never sit through Killers of the Flower Moon, which I absolutely love. But isn't there room at the Oscars for movies that are very, very commercially successful? Yeah, but if they don't really fit in the mold of what a documentary is, and it's just the filming of a concert, I I don't know. I just don't think it warrants to be nominated for Best Documentary. I say, go Taylor Swift. Okay. Get into the uh, Academy Award race. It would be good. And I also think we don't do a good job of including movies that are great big stinking hits in the Oscars. Because that's part of it, right? That's that's an element. Like, put a movie in there that everybody's seen that's done half a billion dollars or whatever. Barbie's going to be in there. Oppenheimer's going to be in there. Both of those are near a billion dollars worldwide. So, so why not include Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour? But is that a reason to put a movie because it did really well at the box office can be i I think it can be it doesn't have to be all like obscure you know i I remember only we go see i remember years ago um and i don't even remember who the comedian was right and this comedian got i don't know whether they got an hbo special or they got some accolade that i just thought was unwarranted 
Yeah. And I talked to, um, I don't know if it was Robert Morton from, from Letterman at the time. I talked to someone like high up okay. in, in the executive producer world of, of, of stand up. Got it. And they said, Oh yeah. Well, he's, he's great. He's got so much energy. And I said, so what? He has a lot of energy. That's why this guy got chosen. He's not funny. I mean, he's not a well, great didn't, comic. You didn't think he was funny. Do other people think him to be funny? I, I, I guess. Comedy I is guess. subjective, right? It is very subjective, but you know, and who's and, the comic? Do you and, know? And, and, and like, I, I don't remember who it okay. was. And, and, and I don't like, like, you know, trashing, but you know, I saw that Kevin Hart is, what was he up for a Mark Twain comedy award? I'm well, like, a, I mean, I don't have an really? issue with that. Mark Twain. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, and I think we've had this conversation before about who's on the cover of Rolling Stone. Right. You know, there was a time if you were on the cover of Rolling Stone, you were such a unique, special, um, you were, you were, you were of, of, uh, like an important force in music. Yeah. You sure. know? Um, and it's just changed, you know, it's, there are people. But okay. So Kevin Hart for you is not in the Mark Twain mode, right? But he is a storyteller for a generation that you're not necessarily part of. So maybe you're just not getting Kevin Hart the way other people get Kevin Hart. I don't know. I, I obviously, you know, I mean, I don't, he's I don't very see- smart and he's like this tall. I don't see him as as being worthy wow. in, the, in 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 that stratosphere to You're get anti heart Mar- well to get a Mark Twain award. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's just a nominee. He has a one, right? Well, to even be in that category, yeah, to yeah. be an uh, to be an option. I just-, just canceled Kevin Hart as a guest on the show. <laughs> we are not going to have Kevin Hart on. I've made my mind up. It's not going to happen. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to talk about Cabbage Patch Kids, which were just, and and to time this, I was a senior in high school when the Cabbage Patch Kids exploded. And of course, being a senior in high school, wasn't paying any attention at all. I, I know everybody had the dolls and it was a big deal. And I saw the news reports about people like going crazy in stores and all that stuff. But I, I was not into the Cabbage Patch Kids, but there have been other great fads in history. So, Sue? What are some fads that you came up with? Um, the mood ring. Oh God, that was so ridiculous. It was really crazy. Yeah. Um, Describe I mean, it because a I, lot of people don't know. All right. So it was like this, I guess it was like plastic, kind of like a round ring. Ring. It was yeah. like, like, uh, and it came in different colors and the colors meant different things and, and, and the color would change. So yes. blue, I guess was happy. Um, black was if you were sad. Red was um, angry. Red was angry and green. I don't know. Maybe you were going to make money or whatever. No, no testing, well, no scientific proof that any of this stuff works. But the ring did change colors all the time. But it did change colors. Yes. Yes. And I and I had one. Uh, we had we had one, too. I I, I remember that one. Well, um, I've got one. The pet rock. Uh, yes. Now, if you if you're. I mean, people were buying these rocks in boxes and they became your pet rock. Now, this may be the stupidest craze of all time (laughs) that you would purchase a rock. By the way, the cost on those rocks, very, very low. It's just you grab a rock and it's your pet rock. But I don't understand what the whole pet rock thing, but it was a thing. It's a weird thing to choose a rock as a pet. Yes. Like, how <laughs> sad is that? Yes. You know? Um, yeah. It's, it's like, you know, having like a leaf. Like a leaf. leaf as a, a pet a, a leaf. leaf. You know, <laughs> it was just such a bizarre object. Yeah. To, to it be a, and, it didn't, and it didn't do anything. No, it right? was just a rock. It was just a rock. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. That was a good one. When you, what else you got? Um, well, I remember trolls. I remember trolls also. And I didn't, um, I didn't, I, I, I don't think I ever bought a troll, but my sister was real. She's three years older. Yeah. She was really into trolls. And I have to find out if she still has this one particular one. Cause they were mostly, they were small. They had like, um, fuzzy hair that, 
that like you oh combed, yeah yeah that you combed up and i guess yeah. they were from scandinavia it, it was inspired by scan scandinavian trolls yeah and um but my sister had a giant one oh, and they really? had like little outfits i guess they had like a little shirt or something <laughs> you know whatever but hers was really it was like this it was giant wow um so that was that was a big big deal when i was growing up okay i've got one so i worked in radio in toledo ohio and uh, i've heard this story that one day in like 1977 the rock and roll station in town um the owner walked into the station with a whole bunch of disco records and said we're switching to disco that's it because it was such a gigantic and remember disco was gigantic there for a couple of minutes and i remember very very clearly my mom and dad learning the hustle do you remember the dance the hustle and then you'd like bump into people <laughs> right and they'd learn they do learned the this they they had this thing they put on the floor and they were learning the steps because they wanted to go dancing and my mom and dad were practicing the hustle <laughs> <laughs> so that was the thing yeah i see your parents you know so we're we're like 10 years i was 10 years ahead of you your, so your parents were doing the jitterbug no, my parents, I don't think I ever saw them dance unless no. they did like a dance at a, at a bar mitzvah, like my brother's bar mitzvah. <laughs> right, I, right. But I never saw them do like fast dancing together. Oh, yeah. No, the hustle. No. Do the hustle. No. Yeah. And I don't even think I saw them do the twist because the twist was huge. Oh, the twist was gigantic. Chucky yeah. Checker. I what mean, about the was... bump? Do you remember the bump? The bump. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like the hustle. And then it was like, you know. That was kind of, it kind of went, it was kind of like a tandem kind of thing. It was, it was the same era. They learned to hustle and they learned to bump. <laughs> Those were your standard dance moves back in 77. All right, one more. What do you got? Well, this is, this is a, a, because a, I didn't play with dolls as a, as a kid because I was a tomboy and there was this gun. It was called a Johnny seven gun. Okay. You have to look it up. You could, I, I actually looked it up to see if, if people, if they, if they still sell it. They're all vintage, but it was a rifle and it was on a stand and they called it a Johnny seven gun because it did seven different things. So you could pull off a pistol from the back of it. It had hand grenades. Um, it had, uh, like plastic pellets. So it, it, it had, it had seven different uses and it was the coolest thing in the world. And I got it as a Hanukkah gift. And the, and when I opened it up, you know, in front of my you know, five kids, so my three brothers and my sister, and my parents, right. and my the youngest of my brothers, who's I'm the youngest, so he's six years older than me. Yeah, he grabbed it and he broke it. He the, broke your. He broke, I guess, the stand part of it. Oh the no! First, so all, I, I then just, it would only be I six. I just minutes. opened it and he broke it. <laughs> Boy, can you imagine that as a toy today? That is so inappropriate. Oh God! Well, I I had I had water pistols. Uh, everything water everything. pistols we had, yeah. But yeah, you're and, and then I had a, like a bazooka that would like shot out like a giant like spray of water. Everything yeah. had a, it was a gun first, and then it did <laughs> then something. It did else. other stuff. And what was that one called? It was a Johnny Seven gun. The Johnny Seven gun. That's interesting. I was I was going to throw one more out here. Okay. What about, and I don't know if this is actually, I, I think it's probably a fad, pink flamingos. Was that yeah, a I, thing? Well, people would put pink flamingos on their, on their lawn. On their front lawn. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, yeah, people, people did do that. And like lawn jockeys, which were just so just politically so inappropriate. Yeah, so my God. Well, you know, I, <laughs> you know, my friend Pat, well, you know, Pat Buckles, right? Yeah. Yeah. So years ago, she and her then husband. Um, you know, I, I was in their house and they had Aunt Jemima, like everything, oh, oh, right? God, so she had dude. Aunt Jemima salt and pepper shakers. She had Aunt Jemima. What like, year was this? Dish. This was uh, in, in the 80s. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and I said to her, you know, I said, do you have like a like a housekeeper? And she said, yeah. And I said, you're a housekeeper plaque. <laughs> and she said, yes. And I said, oh, oh my God. God. You have to get rid of this. Yeah, that's crazy. You can't crazy. have this in your house. Oh, it is Pat. so wrong. That but is. There are people that collected them. Yeah, so she I'm sure. had a collection of these. Of inappropriate things. Inapp inappropriate <laughs> things. <laughs> All right. That's a good one. That's a good one. 
All right, I see our guest popping up here. Cool. Um, our guest today is one of the most innovative documentarians around. At just 19 years old, he directed and starred in a documentary called Room 335. It was bought by H HBO and met with much acclaim. Since then, he's directed documentaries like It's Not Over, The Zen of Bobby V, all-American Family, and Dream Killer. He also hosted and directed the MTV series The World of Jenks for three years. His latest project is Billion Dollar Babies, the true story of the Cabbage Patch Kids. It is playing in select theaters nationwide. Andrew Jenks joins us. Andrew, thank you very much for doing this. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So congratulations on the movie, Billion Dollar Babies. It's, it's so cool because I was in high school in 1983, so I remember this whole Cabbage Patch Kids circus uh, going on. What for you kind of drew you into this story? Uh, so when I first heard about it, uh, you know, I, I, I went on, on YouTube and was just doing, you know, random searches, nothing, nothing, uh, you know, that innovative or profound went on YouTube and just saw the, the melees and the fights and, and, uh, people just so crazed in malls and stores. And I immediately was like, wow, it's so, it's, it's so incredible. It's also amazing that they they were able to the news stations were able to capture that amount of footage in, in eighty three, um, and then as I just went down the rabbit hole over the course of several months and learning about some of the the controversy and, and questions over uh, who had actually invented the Cabbage Patch Kids or came up with kind of the larger concept, I think that's what really started to reel me in and and see that it was bigger than kind of just a a documentary about kind of a fad and, and how that came to be. There were kind of several layers to it. I never realized how many adults were, were into it, you know, like that, <laughs> that, that couple. Oh, yeah. the couple. And I mean, I don't know if they had children because it, it never really, I don't think it ever, I don't know if it ever came out that they had, did, did they have kids? They have children, but um, to your point, that definitely was not uh, the reason they were into Cabbage Patch Kids. It, it was um, their own thing. And, and, you know, as you know, they kind of speak to it in the movie, just the element that I think a lot of people were attracted to in terms of the fantasy component and a toy, if you will, that or a doll that that doesn't do anything, um, but that kind of leaves uh, you to sort of do a lot of things. At least that was kind of their their take on it. So you talked to uh, Xavier uh, Roberts, and yeah. he is a, a reclusive guy. Um, he doesn't do any, you, you did his first interview in like 20 years or a couple of decades. Um, how did you get to him? Um, I mean, this guy is so peculiar, but there's some genius to him too. How'd you get to him? Yeah. So, um, I, I love kind of the hunt for finding someone in, in a documentary. Uh, and I, and I've kind of been a part of that, that journey before and, you know, he was, he's kind of one of the, one of the, if not the main, main character in the movie, if you will. And we actually started filming, not, not having even been in touch with him. Uh, so yeah, it, it took quite a long time. Um, I found, you know, an old uh, high school yearbook of his and started reaching out to high school classmates of his. And there was like, you know, there was kind of this mystique or, or sort of mystery surrounding him, you know, Oh, I, you know, whispers of him living in France these days and all sorts of like kind of bizarre rumors. Because originally he had the house with the second floor and the slide down to a pool on the first. I mean, like he was, he was a little, the cowboy hats he wore carried around debonair bear. I mean, he was, he was such an odd dude. Total character, total character. And, um, and yes, yeah, so, you know, like you said, he hadn't done a, an interview in, in at least 20 years. And even that interview, it was a two minute kind of promo for something. I, I don't, as far as I could tell, he had never done a, an interview where someone sat down and it was like any question goes, they were normally sort of press hits or, or that sort of thing. Um, but like very few pictures of him in the last 20 years, again, just this total mystery man. And uh, so we eventually, you know, I eventually found uh, Della who he has worked with for about 20 years and was able to get on the phone with her. And that was, that was kind of the, uh, the starting steps, but it took, it took a long time. At what point uh, in your research, did you know that there was another person who came up with uh, 
allegedly the model for what he had then created, that woman, Martha uh, Nelson Thomas. Uh, fairly early on, I, I, I saw that there was reports of that, but it wasn't pretty, pretty well into the process, like really quite a while into it, that I finally was able to get hold of the, um, the court case and the transcripts. And, you know, if you had told me going into this that a, a movie about the Cabbage Patch Kids, I'd be reading hundreds of pages of uh, court documents and exhibits and, and it reminded me of some of the kind of wrongful incarceration docs I've done. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Um, but once you kind of get your hands on those where really people are talking on the record and in, in court, you're able to really get a, a larger, uh, just a more detailed, nuanced sense of, of, of what's true and what's not. Cause obviously when you're just Googling things, it's hard to know like what you're reading, what's, where is this coming from? That sort of thing. So it took quite a while to really get into it, I would say. You know, the one thing, and obviously, I mean, I'm just going to make a judgment here. I, I think uh, the the idea was stolen. I mean, it, it just looks very stolen to me. Um, he doesn't seem very apologetic about it, but I think he he did steal the concept. And the one thing he he stole that I think is more important than the dolls is the sort of mythology around uh, uh, Martha Nelson Thomas's baby dolls and the way she treated them and the birth certificate and all this stuff. And he took that to the next level with, you know, uh, people dressed up like doctors and nurses at a, a hospital. And, and you know, you, you do this magical bond between the person and the dog. But I think he totally lifted that from her. Do you agree? Well, that's definitely what uh, Mara um you know, uh, Martha's uh, two kids, uh, that that was her argument in, in the film was, and in general, was that, you know, sure, the, the dolls look alike, um, and that's what most people kind of use as evidence. But her larger point, which, which is what you're saying, is that it, it was actually more about the concept and the idea that each unique doll um, has their own personality has their own name, uh, comes with papers of some sort, whether it's a, a birth certificate or a letter that describes it with with Martha's dolls, the doll babies, um, you know who who this this you know doll is that you're that you're uh, adopting or buying. Uh, you have to be careful with your language with, here. With, and it's with, not a doll; you know, it's, it's a kid. It's not, it's a, not doll. a doll. It's a kid. Yeah, um, it's, it's been super interesting to see. Uh, you know, I'd say. Half the people, it, I, I didn't know what to expect. I'd say uh, people who've seen the film, you know, 50% leave saying um, that what what Xavier says, essentially, that he was inspired by Martha um, and he, and then what, what this section of the pe well, people will say is, he, you know, inspired and, and, um, and a brilliant kind of marketer and businessman and took it to the next level and the other 50 percent will will say what you're saying steve which is uh you know that that sounds all well and nice but like brass tacks he stole the idea um right. and so it's it's been interesting to see how different people sort of um what their takeaway is right well he tried to justify it with you know she didn't have the vision that he had for what this this craze could become you know, she was in her own little small world with it. And he had visions of, like you say, the marketing aspect of it. And I think he kind of, in a way, I think in some ways, I think he kind of admitted that he kind of took the idea. Well, I mean, he that's thanked her at the though. end. He said, "There's none of this would have happened without, without her, her, but without he didn't her. steal the idea. That's right, the conclusion. Right, I think. Right. Well, made. there's a slippery slope. There, and very slippery. Very yeah, slippery. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so much, it's such a fun movie. And the other thing I love is sort of the, the backdrop of the whole thing, which is we just came out of, you know, stagflation and Reagan mm -hmm. was the president and was mourning in America and the economy was getting cranked up and people were looking to buy stuff. And this yeah. thing came along in this sort of capitalist frenzy that happened in the eighties. Um, and so I, I love that aspect of it. It's the greed is good era and the, I better get a cabbage patch kid for my, uh, for my kid. Yeah. And there's that element of, you know, you want what you can't get, 
And yeah. so, you know, Cabbage Patch was kind of its own economy. You know, to your point, there were 150 licenses around the world. Uh, I think they sold $20 million worth of diapers. There was low sugar cereal that didn't do as well. Earmuffs, uh, baby mattresses, bubble gum machines, greeting cards. You know, that one couple says everything from A to Z, apron to a, to a zipper they sold with the, with the Cabbage Patch brand on it. Um, and then, and then there was the, this real, like I said at the top, that element of you want what you can't get. And, and I always think one of the better stories in all of this was when, uh, you know, a, a county court, the, the U.S. government essentially, uh, ended up fielding a false advertising charge against Coleco, the makers of Cabbage Patch, saying that they were quote unquote harassing children by running <laughs> ads for the dolls, uh, which weren't available. And so Cabbage Patch, they actually had to make this big announcement. They're, they're discontinuing advertising, no more commercials. And what did that do? That created an even bigger craze and even more of a demand. And so that, that to me was, uh, was particularly interesting. It also speaks to kind of that, that moment in time in the eighties that, that you're mentioning. You know, the personal connection that people had, like there was this one woman who talked about, you know, if the doll, if, well, the, I, I'm saying they're doll, kids. Like, they're not it, dolls, kids, um, the kids had like, you know, poor eyesight, you know, she would do what she would do with any kid. She would take it to an ophthalmologist or something like that. And it kind of had shades for me of like Lars and the real girl. Mm, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, what it felt like ball. to me, that connection. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's right. Um, and they're, they're, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, uh, it's funny, Sue, because, you know, uh, I, I, it's in the movie a little bit, but one thing that, that, cabbage patch lovers are very sensitive to is is calling calling the kids ugly and uh you know they'll oftentimes make a, the correction they're not ugly they're vulnerable looking and i think um there, there was that sense that you know mass marketed dolls not always but were, were more often than not you know good looking quote you know quintessentially good looking i should say you know dolls and in this case they they certainly were not and that seemed to have a very big impact on the psyche of saying, I want to take care of this doll. I want to take, if there's an issue with its eyes, I want to take it to, you know. Uh, so that was one thing. And the second thing was just that fantasy element that the, the couple spoke to in the movie uh, of, of really kind of living out this, this, you know, uh, this fantasy as it, as it pertained to your, your kids. Well, it's funny because, you know, you would never hear a parent actually say that their kid is ugly, but I, I come from a family of five kids and one of my brothers who is actually so handsome now, he was a very, very ugly baby. And my mother <laughs> told a story about being stopped. She was, you know, the baby was in the carriage and she was Will in the carriage in the neighborhood and someone came by and said, oh, he's so cute. And she said, nah, I know he's really ugly. Oh, that's amazing. That's she hilarious. She actually said that out loud to somebody. I love that. That's hilarious. Brilliant. <laughs> Good for her. So I want to go back a bit. We did some homework on you. So we went back and looked at some of your uh, previous work. One thing, and this is Wikipedia. So uh, when you were 16, you created the Hendrick Hudson Film Festival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where did that idea come from? And that's, I mean, you're a kid, right? You're just a kid and you're thinking of a, a film festival. How did that come about? Uh, so I would make short videos when I was in high school and um, had nowhere to play them. I, I would, you know, make a, a short video and, and then in my parents' basement, you know, play it for a couple of friends. And, um, you know, film festivals are obviously for quote unquote professionals. Some are for college kids. Certainly there weren't any for, for high schoolers. Uh, and so I thought it'd be cool if we had like a little high school film festival in my, uh, you know, kind of small uh, public high school, uh, in, in New York. And, um, and so we had it, uh, in that first year, a handful of people showed up in our, in our non air conditioned, uh, auditorium. Is it true and that James Earl Jones came to the festival? Eventually. Yeah. Um, and you know, we've been doing it now I'm 37. So we've been doing it for almost for about 20 years now. Wow. Now called the, so, so it, it started with just a handful of of uh of students uh i needed to have a teacher to be the supervisor that was the rule and there was one teacher who would do it uh his name's tom 
uh, the festival over the years, it, it went from just my high school to the county, to the state, to the country. Uh, and it got to the point maybe 11, 12 years ago where I looked at Tom, my, my teacher, and said, you know, I think, why don't we really, you know, take the next step? So we now have the All-American High School Film Festival. Uh, he runs it full time. Uh, we have thousands of submissions every year from all over the world, 30 countries, all 50 states. We've given out millions of dollars in scholarships. Wow. The top few hundred films are played at the AMC theaters in Times Square one weekend in October. Um, and it's the biggest high school film festival in the world. Uh, wow. and, and he runs it full time now. So it's been, uh, yeah, that's been quite a, quite a, quite a journey. I mean, I've run a couple of film festivals. They are hard, man. I that's did right. the, uh, I used to own theaters out in Palm Springs and we did the Palm Springs, um, the Palm Springs lesbian and gay film festival. We did the oh, wow. Palm Springs Jewish film festival. Oh, wow. And they are super tough to run. I mean, that's right. 16, it sounds like you, or, you know, you didn't have necessarily a lot of, and by the way, that, that whole concept now, there's been a democratization of the ability to make movies. So That's high right. school kids now have access to stuff. I mean, an iPhone, you can That's make right. a movie. So I would imagine that's a huge driving force in the number of entries you actually get. hundred percent. Right. Yep. You, you, you know, I've, I've shot scenes in movies where, you know, I'm in a hospital or something where I'm not, uh, you know, allowed to film, have proper access, not doing anything that I, you know, morally don't think I should be doing, but you know, and I'm, I'm filming with an iPhone. It happens, you know, it happens and there's, and, you know, uh, 99% of people don't notice the difference when it, when, you know, it's on an iPhone. So. Well, I marvel at the film that you made the room 335. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. Because I, I've worked in reality TV for, for a long time. And, um, when I was, I worked on the Osbournes and when I worked on the Osbournes, um, well, I worked on the Osbournes, and then I worked on this, this show with Nick and Jessica, Newlyweds. And oh, those are two we legendary went, uh, shows in 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 the reality in reality history. Those are two pretty big shows to be a part of. Wow! So, and when we when we do a Nick and Jessica, Nick's um, grandmother lived at an assisted living facility, and um, she had a boyfriend, and um, they it was really hard to get the facility to allow us to shoot there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then, you know, like while we were doing it, an editor of mine that I worked very closely with, I said, we should do a show inside an assisted living mm. facility. This yeah. would be the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. But the fact that we came from the Osbournes and newlyweds, no one would let us shoot there. They just thought we were going to be making fun of people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, how did you get access? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, when I was 19, I, I, the summer after college, I, I dropped out and moved into a nursing home for, for one summer. Uh, and, um, sentences you never expected to hear. I moved into a nursing home for one. And summer. I want to know how you even came up with the idea to do something like this. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, uh, well, I, I went to NYU, uh, freshman year. I thought it'd be, you know, uh, a chance to to get my hands on cameras and, and start making things. And for better or worse, it works for some people, didn't really work for me. It was mostly all theory. And I had issues with depression and I just wasn't really enjoying it. And I thought like, man, it, I got to go and just like figure out a way how to make a movie. Um, I knew a scripted film would cost too much. I didn't have the money to do that. Documentaries were like kind of on the rise. Michael Moore was very popular at the time. Um, and so was, uh, Morgan Spurlock with his super size me movie. Yeah. I remember with both of those, I thought, oh, interesting. The filmmaker is also the star of the movie and, um, and producing it and directing it. And you don't need to hire all these different like roles. They're just can kind of do it all. And my grandfather at the time was in a nursing home. I was really close with him. And so with all those kind of different moving parts, I thought, well, what if I made a movie about living in a nursing home? Um, and uh, I could make it very cheaply. I, there was cameras on eBay that I could buy for, for not that much money. Um, and so, yeah, I started calling nursing homes uh, around the New York area because that's, you know, easy to get to. That's where I was. Uh, they all said no, you know, 20, 30 places all said no. It's, it's the, in the beginning of the movie, everyone's saying no. And it, 
it made sense. HIPAA violations, privacy concerns. Again, Michael Moore, very popular at the time. I think a lot of people pretty fairly thought I might be trying to do some sort of expose, which I wasn't. Uh, and then eventually a place in Florida I called Harbor Place. Um, I, I never asked why I didn't want, I didn't, I just wanted to get there. They said, oh, you know, that's, that's such an interesting idea. A 19 year old, you know, living in a nursing home, um, you know, you know, and filming it like that, that might be a really cool concept and people might be into that. And, um, and so I, I knew, I knew that you needed these things called release forms. So I, I found those online. They, they signed those and, and, you know, we filmed 200 hours of footage, um, moved back into my parents. I moved back into my parents' basement and just started editing it. Wow. You know, culturally, I think we do such a terrible job of taking care of seniors or actually just listening. Uh, that's, that was the key to your documentary. I think room 335 was that you were willing to go in there and actually listen and engage. And I, I think seniors, I, I think people disregard age and wisdom an awful lot. And you really captured what's going on there and sort of the stories and the lives. Life does not stop once people move into an assisted living facility. It it continues and you took the time to listen. And I think that's what makes your documentary work. Yeah, that actually means a lot. I really appreciate that. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, to your point, it's, it's not in the documentary, but um, a moment that I always will remember and, and gets me a little bit emotional is, uh, you know, I, there is the, a lot of times people think that they don't realize how how a senior citizen is actually there in their own way. And there was this one woman that a lot of times maybe seemed out of it. And uh, um, a, her son, you know, her adult son came and visited her for like an hour or something. And I went up to her afterwards and I said, Oh, your son came. That was so nice. And she said, yeah, but if someone um, visits you for an hour and looks at their watch 12 times, were they really there? Mm. And I have endless examples of that where, I mean, even in the end of the movie, which is in the movie, when I go visit Dottie in the hospital, um, I'm not a particularly religious person. I knew she was though. And so as I'm kind of awkwardly standing there, she's, you know, hours away from passing away. Um, God, I haven't talked about this in so long, but as, as you know, hours away from passing away, um, uh, this too kind of is, a, you know, she, um, you know, I said, I, I, I just knew that she was, she was fairly religious. So I said, I'm going to, uh, take a knee and, and pray for you. Um, I don't think I've ever taken a knee and prayed in my life. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I did that and I kind of clasped my hands together. And as I, it's in the movie, as I did that, you know, she did that too. Yeah. And it was this, I mean, it gives me chills, like this moment where I was convinced she, I mean, if you watch it, she's at, like, she's shaking. It's yep. like not there, mm -hmm. but in that, in that moment, you know, and I, you know, I, I don't, I, I just, to me, it's like they're, they're you know, I, I, anyway, that, that was, uh. To your point, Steve, I, I uh, uh, I'm I'm happy that that was one thing that that came across in the movie. And you know, some of some of the women were very selfless about the whole idea of being in a facility. Like yes. some of them said that um, I think you had talked to them about maybe living with their families, and they were like, right. "Oh no, I I don't want to put that burden. They've lived their lives. Um, you know, I'm I'm in my mid 60s, and I remember when I was growing up, the idea of you know ever my grandparents ever going anywhere." Um, except for coming into our house. And I remember it did come up at one point with my father's mother. And I remember my mother thinking, no way, yeah. no way yeah. Um, yeah. is she going to be living in this house with my young children? It's, I just don't want that. And it, I mean, it's just so heartbreaking to think that somebody would go there and not want to be there. Cause I, I've been to many assisted living facilities over the years. Um, and and it's just the age thing. Like when I think of Bill, he said he was 80. Yeah. And I was trying to put that into perspective. And I was thinking, Ringo Starr is 80 years old. Yeah, right. You know, and you just look at the disparity between Bill and Ringo Starr at the same <laughs> age. Yeah. It's just mind boggling, you know? Yeah, no, no, that that's certainly true. And you know, Bill, Bill was actually, I always thought an example of someone where an assistant, assisted living facility worked well for him. Um, because, you know, I think if 
from what I can recall about his family, uh, you know, maybe there was somewhere he could stay with an adult who was working full time and, and he would have been kind of just at the house, you know, alone, you know, in that assisted living facility, as you could see, he was walking around, he was chatting it up with everyone. He was, you know, you know, causing his own version of chaos. And so, uh, you know, it, you know, it was interesting that, that in his scenario, it, it kind of worked, I think, and, and made sense for, for him being able to stay active. Um, but yeah, the, the age people, you know, aging it, it in different ways is certainly, uh, certainly interesting. So I, I just had, I just had one other question. Yeah. Did, did you, did, like after you were done, did you ever have any connection with any of these people after? Did you stay in uh, touch with, with any of these oh, people? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. No. Um, so I, uh, yeah, so I, HBO ended up buying the movie, which is a whole other story and pretty, pretty wild one. But, um, uh, I, I visited the, the facility about a year later and my mom had, had obviously seen the movie and been watching me edit it. So she came too to visit. Um, and I showed Tammy and Libby, two of kind of the stars, if you will. And it was funny. We started watching it and, and Tammy said, can you just fast forward to the parts that we're in? I don't, I live this every day. <laughs> um, and then, and I start. so I did that. Then I started showing it to Bill and within a few minutes, Bill was like, you know, who's that, you know, Bill, who was the, the, you know, always, always looking out, looking for ladies. Yes. Like, hey, who's that woman sitting next to you? And I was like, my mom, <laughs> um, and, you know, just went, went to show that they, the cameras and the movie, they, that was cool for them, but you know, they're not looking for fame at 80, 90 years old. They were like, they just loved hanging out with a bunch of 19 year olds for a summer. Um, but then, you know, when the movie came out and it came out, you know, in different countries around the world, not just domestically here, uh, I set up a thing on our website where you could click on a, a photo of any one of the, the sort of main people that are featured in the movie and write them a, a note, an email, whatever. And so that was um, so I'm, cool. It was so cool. And so obviously none of them used email, but, um, I would call them and, um, and we would have someone read to them these messages that they were getting from all of, all over the world. Um, and so there was all sorts of, you know, I sent them our, our first film festival that we won. Uh, we sent them that award. Um, we sent them the movie poster that HBO made. So definitely stay in touch. And then the crazy thing was that, uh, I forget maybe a year or two after the after I I was there uh Tammy and Bill really the two stars of the movie um both passed away the same week. Oh. Mm. So I always joked like you know I I think God saw the movie and just couldn't wait to meet them any longer cuz <laughs> that to me was just so crazy. Mm. So you did a series for MTV called World of Jinx mm. and uh Oh, it's a great, it's a great concept. We, I, we both went back and watched uh, episodes of it. You did one where you wanted to be a rap star. And so you were working with a rapper named Mano, uh, who had been in prison for 10 years. He had like this big scar on his face. And at one point in the episode, he like shoves you into the wall and it looks, it looks scary. Now mm -hmm. you don't seem scared. You seem like this is almost like you feel a moment to bond. Describe sort of that. Yeah. So, um, you know, MTV uh, became aware of of the nursing home movie, and and so the thought was, what if I, what if I didn't move into a nursing home, but for MTV, kind of would move into different worlds or subcultures that were a little bit more like MTV sort of suitable. In other words, just not a nursing home, but a young people of different types. And so with my kind of sales hat on, I thought, you know, the first episode maybe should be a musician of some sort, you know, and so a rapper came, came to, came to be. And then down the line, I knew like we would focus on other things that I was, you know, the second episode was a young man who had autism. The third mm -hmm. was a young woman who was homeless and we kind of, got there but that first episode yeah was was with Mano uh who had a hit song at the time called All the Above and um and uh yeah uh we were uh filming I guess it was backstage one night and uh and I uh 
you know, was questioning, you know, he was, he was pretty proud that he was a, a role model to a lot of young people. And I was, and I was questioning probably pretty naively and maybe ignorantly as well that how true that might have really been. Um, and that, you know, struck, certainly struck a chord with him as you can, as you see in the episode. Um, and, you know, I've, you know, it, it ended up leading us to like more interesting places um, in that, you know, I think the next day we ended up going to bed where he was from and, and hanging yes. out with his friends. And, you know, it's been quite a while, but I, I think we then went to school and picked up his kid. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know if I was scared per se. I, I didn't really have time to be scared. Like when you're getting choked, you're just kind of like trying to un get unchoked. <laughs> yes. uh, it, it all happens very quickly, you know, <clears throat> sorts of things. So, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, people don't, yeah, people that, that was definitely, uh, you know, uh, quite an experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. You you've you've done so many cool things. I just I love I love where you where your where your head is at when you're when you're doing these these really unique projects. Because I, I watched the one where you went to San Francisco and um yeah. live with the homeless woman, yeah. Danielle. Yep, Danielle. And um yeah, I mean it was just so moving. Uh and was there ever like so what 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 were you feeling when you were you know, sleeping out on the street in, in areas that could have been dangerous. I mean, did you ever have any kind of sense of concern or fear or, you know, being jumped or someone, yeah. you know, beating you up or? Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of my bigger takeaways was just the level of vulnerability, particularly when you're going to sleep, particularly for a, a woman. Um, frankly, I don't, I don't know. That was my personal takeaway. Uh, you know, Danielle, heavy, as we called her heavy D, um, you know, she obviously, she was a woman. And so the idea that she, uh, every night was going to sleep on her own in a corner or, you know, the woods or wherever it may be, uh, that to me was like really terrifying. Uh, you know, my, you know, week doing that, you know, with my, with, with my camera guy and, you know, it was just me, my camera guy and, 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 uh, and Danielle, um, I, I, you know, you do feel vulnerable doing that, but, but what really struck me was the idea that she did this all the time and hmm. how dangerous that, yeah, how dangerous that really felt. I think a lot of people don't understand. Um, I, I used to run with a group of people down in Skid Row. They're called okay. Skid Row uh, Marathon and they, they do marathons. And they actually and, made a really good documentary. And they made an amazing documentary yeah. about it. It's called Skid Row Runners. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, you talk to some of these people and they would go to this, they were, they would, they were living at this midnight mission, but you know, people say, Oh, you know, they, they don't have to live on the street and all of that. But you know, the process of getting into, um, a, a place, you know, it's not like you get a room and it's your room and then you're just there every day, every morning you have to leave and then. You have to, you know, and then you come back and if there's a room available, there's a room available. Um, but every day you have to do this process. And I guess a lot of people were kind of fearful of, uh, and look, it's, there's a lot of mental illness and things like that, but, um, there, there's a lot more involved in it than, you know, oh, I just want to live on the street. You know what I mean? I mean, and then, and then uh, again, there are people that, kind of feared living in a place because they were, they would get robbed or they didn't like the reason why they were living on the street is that the conformity of living in a place with structure did not work with where their mind was at, I guess. You know? Yeah. They, you know, you also need like, you know, with Danielle, uh, you know, we, you know, it's in the show, we went up and, and met her family in, in, in Oregon and, you know, my personal opinion and I, pretty much express it as, as I recall in the episode was that she didn't really have at all a, a support system. And so when I, when we were done filming, um, you know, I, I felt very strange, uh, maybe a, a little bit, uh, what's the word, um, guilty that, you know, you know, all right, you know, 
that was fun. I, I was homeless with you for a week and filmed it. And now I'm back onto my life and you're going to still be here on the streets. Yeah. Like, something felt kind of morally wrong about it all. Uh, and so I forget who I was talking to, but I, I said, you know, do I give her some money to help her get an apartment or, a, you know, a job? And, and there might've been a, some, some of that, but, um, the, the, the biggest thing I, I forget who gave me this advice was, you know, it sounds like what she really needs is a, is a support system. And so what I did, and they said, you know, maybe helping her with an apartment or a job might just end up coming and going because she's not as familiar with, with how those sorts of things work and, and sustain, sustain themselves. And I don't want to speak like I know, and she doesn't. Um, what I did end up doing regardless is getting her a phone, uh, a cell phone and saying, Hey, like, we're going to talk every few days. And if, and if, and if you don't call me, I'm going to be calling you and we're going to, uh, really stay in touch. And, and that way, uh, we'll be able to like work on this together. And so we did do that for, for several years. Um, and, uh, and that was always, and that was true with a lot of the different people I filmed was this, I, this thing of like popping into their lives, filming it, and then going off on my merry way. And that was, that's always something that you kind of have to, you know, balance. So <laughs> last project I want to ask you about is dream killer. Uh, which is a documentary you made about this kid who got absolutely railroaded by the justice system. Uh, no physical evidence whatsoever. He's basically convicted because his friend had some sort of dream that, yeah. uh, that Ryan Ferguson was the killer here. I mean, I, it, what struck me about the documentary is that anybody could get railroaded. And it makes me wonder how many innocent people are actually imprisoned right now. Listen, I mean, you have, if there's an unsolved murder out there and two people say that you did it, that's all that, that's all that you need. And sometimes even less than that. So if you, if there, if you add on to that, an unsolved murder that for two years in, in Columbia, Missouri was, was, was the only unsolved murder in the history of this small town. And there's a lot of pressure to figure out who did it. And you have a district attorney that is essentially corrupt. Uh, you know, you put the math together and, and, and it's actually very easy to do something like this. Uh, so for those reasons and, and a few others, uh, Ryan Ferguson, uh, who had nothing to do with the murder, like in the wasn't even there, wasn't even there, like as guilty as you or me, uh, um, you know, was, was put behind bars, given a $20 million bail, the highest, I think in the history of the United States, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's in the movie. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, sent, sent to, to, to rot away. Uh, Ryan, I have always said, and his dad, if there was ever two people that were kind of built to, to go to battle and withstand that, that kind of that kind of hand of, uh, you know, that kind of car, car being dealt that, that kind of cards, uh, they, they were, they're the ones, uh, zero self pity, you know, no, no, why me, why us just like the guilty verdict came down and they were like, all right, now we have to, now we have to fight now time to figure it out. Yeah. And if it takes us nine and a half years, which is what it ended up taking. It takes us nine and a half years. Mm. And, uh, Ryan uh, has become one of my best friends. I'm going to his bachelor wow. party in a in a couple months. Oh wow! Wow. Um, yeah, he's he's a dear, dear, like very very close friend of mine. We're the same age, um, and similar interests and and the whole thing. So, um, uh, yeah, no, that was you know we started that movie uh, thinking we were gonna make something like Errol Morris and the Thin Blue Line, where yeah, yeah. we were gonna kind of make a movie to prove that he was innocent. And we were starting to edit it. And as we were editing it, uh, he, he was released. And so we, we actually changed the whole movie and made it much more about his dad. Yeah. His, his dad, dad is great. His dad's up, you know, you couldn't script his dad. Um, so we ended up focused, you know, obviously it's on Ryan as well, but a lot of it is on Bill Ferguson and his, his journey over those, those years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, yeah. um, you've got a fascinating 
career. We went, I went back and looked at, I mean, I strongly recommend room 335. Um, the dream killer, really, really good. Check that out. And, uh, and we appreciate you sharing part of your career with us. The new movie is Billion Dollar Babies, the true story of the Cabbage Patch Kids. It is playing in select theaters nationwide right now. Andrew, thank you so much for doing this, man. We really appreciate it. Well, listen, I'll say, I, you know, been doing a lot of interviews. I, I don't, there's no one that's come close to, uh, the time and that you guys have put into, uh, into the research and some of the questions you've asked. So I, I appreciate you doing that and I appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank oh, you very much. Thank you so Andrew. much. I'm going to go watch the Osbournes and uh, <laughs> those, are some, those are classic, <laughs> classic shows. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yep. Yep. I've been chasing that high my whole career. Yeah. I mean, those are, <laughs> those are, those are his, his, historic. So um, cool. awesome, man. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, for, thank you. Thanks for doing this and congratulations on the movie, man. All right. Thank you guys. There you have it, Andrew Jenks. Uh, very kind words from him. We we definitely put time into getting ready for this show. We're not we're not messing around here on the Culture Pop Podcast. So. You do your homework. Yeah, exactly. I mean, could you imagine just oh, he did this one movie, and then like you don't know all this really cool stuff that he's done in his yeah, life. Yeah, you know. So. And by the way, the movie's fantastic. It's great. It is such a time capsule about an era and a time and a craze and what drove it. By the way, one of the things that drove the Cabbage Patch kids crazy was the the scarcity. I meant to ask him this, if that scarcity was on purpose or if they just couldn't make them fast enough. Right, right. Well, yeah, well, it was brought up with the uh, Coleco uh, executive and he said, no, we did not do that. But yeah, just couldn't make them fast enough. Just right. couldn't make them fast enough. All right. There you have it. There's our Culture Pop podcast. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, give us a five star rating on Apple Spotify and leave us a review. We really appreciate that. Helps us with the algorithm and all that stuff. Sue, great seeing you. And we will see everybody next time on the Culture Pop podcast. Mm -hmm.